Okay, so the real numbers. Um, real numbers are really fundamental to the study of real analysis, rather unsurprisingly. Um, so having a good, strong construction of them is quite helpful in writing proofs and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so the formal sort of traditional way of constructing the real numbers is through a process called uh, Didakind Cuts. Um, and while that's a really good process and we will revisit it, it's not entirely necessary for the sort of early stages. And it can kind of be a bit abstract because um, it requires you know, a fair amount of maturity, mathematical maturity, because you've got um, concepts that don't immediately seem worthwhile. Um, so we're actually going to do a slightly different construction, which is sort of halfway there. And then we're going to build up limits and integrals and all of that sort of stuff formally using our construction of the real numbers and then we're going to revisit the construction of the real numbers, real numbers do it properly and um, yeah hopefully that should be good. Um, so in this video we will work on um, building up the machinery for it first and then next one we'll actually do the construction. Um, so the first thing is we need a structure and I'll go very quickly over some sort of basics of um, abstract algebra and sets. Um, hopefully you know what a set is, but if you don't, a set is a collection of elements. You know, it could be one, two, you know, so on and so forth. Or they could be letters, A, B, C. Um, words, if you were to want words. You know, they can be anything, and they can be really, really small. You can have the empty set, which has absolutely nothing in it, or you can have indefinitely large sets. Um, or you can have indefinitely large sets, and actually figuring out how big a set is is fairly interesting, um, especially when they are indefinitely large. Um, but anyway... A set by itself, it's useful, it's interesting, but for our purposes it's not entirely enough. We want something more, we want to introduce, introduce a structure on the set. So there's a lot of potential structures that we could be concerned with. You've got groups, rings, um, etc. Um, but that's sort of covered in the field of maths known as abstract algebra. For us, we're really just concerned with one particular structure known as a field. So a field um, is a structure with two operations. You've got, well for starters you actually have to have the set itself, you have to have an addition operator and you have to have a multiplication operator. And now um, what we're going to do is we're going to say the set's just got letters in it as I said, it could be general, it could have words in it, it could have numbers in it, but we'll just give it letters for the meantime. Um, so addition and multiplication, they act the way you'd expect them to act. So A plus B equals B plus A. So addition commutes. Um, addition is associative. Um, yeah. Then we've got... Um, what other properties do we have? We have an additive identity element, so that's an element which we denote with zero, um, which doesn't change it. Um, addition has to be closed, so A plus B has to be an element of a set, or, or the element of the set always. Um, and we have to have an additive inverse, so that's a number, call it negative A. Um, such that when you add it to A, you get that um, identity element. Um, you have to have the exact same properties for this idea of multiplication. So A times B equals B times A. Um, multiplication commutes. Multiplication is associative. Um, so really, every, all the properties are just what you would expect to happen. Need a bit more space. Um, you, we have the additive, the multiplicative identity, which we denote 1, 
which is again exactly as you would expect. Um, and you have the multiplicative inverse, oh sorry, multiplication has to be closed, A times B has to be an element of the set, and the multiplicative inverse, which we denote with a little power of minus one. Um, right, so literally exactly what you would expect to happen um, with addition and multiplication. We impose an additional rule which I will write down here, which is the distributive property, um, which is again exactly what you would expect um, when working with normal numbers. And that's good because we're trying to construct the real numbers, we should have the properties we're familiar with. Um, so an example of a field is the rational numbers. Rational numbers are a field, they have all these properties, so they're good. Um, the natural numbers aren't a field because they don't have a multiplicative inverse, nor do they have an additive inverse. Um, the integers are a little bit closer to being a field because they do have the additive inverse, but they don't have the multiplicative inverse. Um, so sort of each time we step down and each time we generalize it, we end up introducing more structure or at least we don't lose structure. So we should expect to see the same thing going from the rational numbers to the real numbers, is it at least has this structure, um, the field structure. So these are called the field axioms. They're pretty much, as I said, exactly what you would expect. If you can't remember what they are, just think what does, what happens with the rational numbers and those are the axioms for the field pretty much. Um, and that's good. So we've now got a way of sort of treating the numbers, combining the numbers in some sort of way, but we want a further notion of order. Um, and that's where this idea of, no, oh, I've run out of canvas. Um, that's where this idea of order comes in. I will move us down here. Keep that on the screen, may as well. Um, so order is, um, what you'd expect it to be. Um, it's an idea of a less than or equal to or a greater than or equal to or a less than or a greater than or anything of those sort of inequality properties. And again, it behaves the way you'd expect it to behave. So A is less than or equal to A. Cool. Um, we have if a is less than or equal to b and b is less than or equal to c that means that a is less than or equal to c right again a property that we would expect to see um, we have one more property hold up let me just check um, Uh, we have the further property that if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to A, then A equals B. Um, so again, properties that we're familiar with, properties that you'd expect to have with the um, rational numbers, properties that you have even with the natural numbers, properties that we've just got with numbers we impose as an order. Um, so we've now sort of constructed this notion of an ordered field. So addition behaves the way you'd expect, multiplication behaves the way you'd expect, order, inequalities, they behave the way you'd expect them to. Um, and again, these are just axioms, we're stating them to be true, they do exist structures where these axioms aren't satisfied and they are quite interesting, but uh, again, for the construction of the real numbers, we don't have to worry about them. And when we're going off to write proofs, what's really, really nice about setting this down is we can come back to it and we can say we're going to use the additive associative property in our proof. We're going to, we're going to use, you know, the reflexivity of the um, inequality in our proof and stuff like that. And really just all of the theorems you're familiar with from high school calculus, high school number theory, still apply pretty much because we've got these notions that um, that we're familiar with. Okay, next thing I want to talk about, but I will clear the board quickly, 
is a notion of um, the infimum and the supremum. I stuffed that up. <laughs> Can you cut that? Um, actually, let me clear the board first, and then I'll come back to that Mr. Person who's editing it. Um, so the next thing we want to introduce is an idea of um, sort of upper bounds and least upper bounds or more fancy word terminology wise um, the inf and the soup um, I'm gonna call that sup but that's fine it is soup <laughs> um, anyway so what is an upper bound if you have a set we're gonna call the set s um, and it's you know it's got some elements in it and you've got some you know, subset of S, which we're going to call A. Um, now, A doesn't necessarily have to be a proper subset, but it's kind of more convenient to think about it as a proper subset. And what we need in this set is it doesn't necessarily need to have the structure of a field, but what it does need is order. So uh, those properties we discussed before of an inequality. Um, so an upper bound of the subset A um, so A is a subset, and it's, you know, got some, you know, maybe one, three, so on, so forth in it. An upper bound of that subset, say we'll call it A, little a, um, is a number, uh, is an upper upper bound, I think that's about right. Um, A is an upper bound if, um, so the first thing it needs to be is it actually has to be an element of the set. A has to be an element of S. It doesn't necessarily have to be an element of the subset, but it does have to be an element of the overarching set. Um, and we need it to be such that um, for all, um, say, I picked a poor letter, but B being an element of A. Um, so for all elements in A, A is greater than or equal to B. Right, so with our setup here, say 1, 3, 12 and 13, um, if that was our set A, then 45 is an upper bound, because 45 is greater than or equal to all of the elements in our subset. Um, 200 is also an upper bound. 17 is an upper bound, but 6 isn't, because there exist numbers in our subset which um, 6 isn't greater than or equal to, and it has to be all the numbers in the set. Um, okay, so that's an upper bound, and it's a pretty simple notion. It's what you'd expect an upper bound would be. A lower bound is the converse. It's just a number that's smaller than all of the numbers in the set. So you see why this notion of order is important, because if we didn't have an order, we wouldn't be able to talk about a number being bigger than another number. Um, and whilst upper bounds are good, almost all ordered sets, I think probably all ordered sets, but I wouldn't quote that, um, have the ability to have an upper bound of some description. Um, but having a single upper bound, most of the time, you know, in the situations we're familiar with, we can think of a smaller one. Um, so we might want to find what's known as the least upper bound, which is denoted by sup of A, um, short for supremum or something along those lines. So the sup of A is an upper bound, so let's just call it um, little s. Sup of A um, is an upper bound, so S is an upper bound, that's one of the properties, you get the idea. S has to be an upper bound, but furthermore, and this is probably going to take up a bit of space, um, 
not only does S have to be an upper bound, but it has to have the property that for all um, A being less than S, so for all elements that are smaller than A, there exists some, we'll call it B, being an element of the subset such that um, A is less than B. So basically what that's saying is that any number smaller than S is no longer an upper bound because it will no longer satisfy this property over here. So that means that this for all property is untrue. And breaking my canvas. Um, okay, so that's kind of intuitive. That makes a lot of nice sense. And we've got this nice little definition for what it has to be. So it should be easy for us to write proofs for and against upper bounds or least upper bounds. Um, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. We'll go, we'll do a quick sort of basic example of a set with an upper bound. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to cover in this video. But yeah, okay, we'll do a quick example. Um, so suppose you have the set which is S, um, and S is equal to the set of, um, say, 1 over N, um, where N is just an integer, so N is an element of the natural numbers. Um, and this is just stock standard rational numbers, we're not worrying about any abstract algebra stuff like that exactly what you'd expect. So this set consists of one, a half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, so on and so forth. So what's the upper bound? Well, five is an upper bound of S, yeah? Because why is five an upper bound of S? Is five an element of our, sorry, I keep breaking my canvas. Is five an element of our overarching set? Well, that depends what our overarching set is, but we'll just assume it's the rational numbers for now. Five's an element of the rational numbers. Okay, so the first property is satisfied. And then for all elements of our set, um, all of them are less than five. One over n for n being an integer is less than five. That's a fairly trivial idea. Um, it could be a good exercise to write a proof on that, but I'm not going to. Um, all right, but what about a least upper bound? Well, we know that the least upper bound is one. Um, one is an upper bound, yeah, it is. Sorry. One's an upper bound because it um, it is greater than or equal to all of the elements. One is greater than or equal to one. It happens to be equal to, but it's definitely greater than or equal to. And every other element is less than one, so that's good. One is certainly an upper bound. So the first property over here is satisfied. Um, and what about this long property down here? Every number less than it, there exists some other element greater than it. Sorry, that didn't make a huge amount of sense, I'll be honest. But um, let's just take some random number that is less than one. So let's look at a half. Is one half an upper bound? Because if it is, then one's not the least upper bound. Well, let's have a look. Does there exist some number in our set which is less th um, such that a half is less than it? Well, sure there does. One. Because one is an element of our set, and a half is less than one, which means that this property is not satisfied. Because you can't be both greater than or equal to and less than. So, okay, a half's not an upper bound, that's promising. Um, let's take 0. Point, oh, sorry. Let's take 0. 0.9. 0. 0.9, again. 0. 0.9 is less than 1, but 0. 0.9, well, exactly, 0. 0.9 is less than 1, which means that because 1 is an element of the set, any number less than one can't be an upper bound, which means that if one is an upper bound, it is most certainly the least upper bound. And that's a really nice property that we can use in future 
and we will use in future, is that if an element of a subset is an upper bound, sorry, if an upper bound of a subset is also an element of that subset, then it must be the least upper bound. And that's a theorem that we will prove eventually and we'll use it a few times and it's quite a useful one, so we will revisit that. Um, yeah, okay. Sorry, this was a bit of a all over the place video. We had a few things to cover, a few sort of pieces of um, mathematical terminology to get through, so I'll quickly recap it. We discussed a field where a field is a structure that we can impose onto a set. Um, it's a structure with an addition. Um, uh, an addition operator and a multiplication operator and they behave the way you'd expect them to. So field, addition and multiplication and they're just normal. We also talked about order and how again order is just working with inequalities and it behaves normally. And then towards the end we very sort of briefly talked about um, the sup soup of a set um, which is the least upper bound of a set and it is just an upper bound of a set, so it's bigger than all the elements, but it's the smallest upper bound of a set. Um, and we gave a very, very rough example of, you know, the least upper bound. Um, I didn't actually ever write it out, but sup of s is equal to 1, right? Um, and again, I will just briefly say it, I think I said it before, but there does exist this thing called the inf, um, that is not an n, i n f, right? Inf, and the inf of s is just the greatest lower bound, and it's equal to zero. Now, notice one is an element of s, but zero is not an element of s. So it doesn't have to be, but it can be. Um, anyway, I hope all of that makes sense. We will rely on it, but none of it was super complicated, so I thought I'd just cover all of it right now. Um, Next time we're going to use a few of these properties to actually construct the real numbers. Um, and yeah, in future we'll come back and we'll use these properties a lot more because they are very useful. Uh, anyway, cool. Thank you.